Well, good morning, it's noon. Um, welcome to the third research forum of this spring season. It's nice to see you all um, and welcome back. It's kind of a high pollen day, so you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. Um, you know how it is. Anyway, the forum, the forum's sort of format's gonna be like it has been in the past. We're gonna have two presenters today, two of our former fellows, who are gonna talk for roughly 20 minutes each and then we'll have about a 15 minute chance to ask them questions. We have a chat box that's been enabled so you can type in your questions there that I'll read during the Q&A session. And of course, if you feel comfortable or you'd like to ask a more nuanced question than one that I'm gonna read, you can um, unmute yourself and ask them a question directly during that 15 minute period. Um, once again, our fellowship program happens because of the support of an awful lot of library staff. I get the pleasure of having these sort of conversations with our fellows, but the only reason this is able to happen is because so many of you worked so very hard um, to make their research possible. Um, today's speakers, the first speaker is gonna be Sierra Rourke. And Sierra received a Wilson Library Southern Studies Pre-Dissertation Prospectus Fellowship that's funded by the Watson Brown Foundation. And our second speaker will be um, Gina Kaysen, who was a visiting research fellow last summer, who received an uh, award um, funded by the John Eugene and Barbara Hilton Kay Research Fund that supports study of um, literary culture and traditions in the American South. Right now, I'll, I'll read a little more extensive biography of each of our um, presenters. So Sierra is a PhD student here in the Department of Anthropology at UNC Chapel Hill. She studies plant human past human plant relationships with an emphasis on food ways and medicinal strategies. Her dissertation investigates archaeological and historical evidence of plant use in the 17th and 18th century Chesapeake, emphasizing exchange, power, and identity. Uh, Gina Kaysen is an associate professor of English at Georgia State University, where she teaches courses in Southern literature, Native American literatures, and documentary practices. Her first book, Red States, Indigeneity, Settler Colonialism, and Southern Studies, which was published by the UGA Press in 2018, won the 2019 C. Hugh Holman Award for Best Book in Southern Literary Studies. Along with Lisa Einrichsen and Stephanie Roundtree, she's co-editor of Small Screen Souths, Region, Identity, and Cultural Politics of Television, which was put out by LSU Press in 2017, and Remediating Region, New Media in the U.S. South, also by LSU in 2021. She's currently president of the Society for the Study of Southern Literature and has just returned to Atlanta following a year as a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Budapest. Um, well, Sierra, I guess we'll start with you and allow you to introduce your talk. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, does everybody see it? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so first I wanted to thank uh, Matt and Nadia for arranging this forum. I really appreciate having the chance to hear about others' experience and to talk a little about my own time in the archives. Um, so before I get too much into my findings, I think it makes sense for me to explain my background a little bit, um, especially with how my project has changed since early 2020. Um, I'm a doctoral student here at UNC in the Department of Anthropology, and my specialty is in historical archaeology and archaeobotany, um, which means that I study um, plant remains from archaeological context, so human plant relationships and entanglements. Um, and to give you a little info on that, um, this is some of the material that we find in, in archaeological um, excavations. Um, and within archaeobotany, I, I specialize in macrobotanical analysis. So plant remains that are visible to the naked eye, um, while others would look at things like phytoliths or starch residues. Um, so, so with macrobotanical remains, we have a real bias toward denser plant remains and seeds. Um, it also depends on preservation. Um, and in the American South, there's not great preservation unless you have a context that is kind of shielded from the elements. Um, so the majority of my, my findings are um, carbonized, which just meaning they're burned. Um, and so there's um, also a, a, 
an issue with where we get samples from. Often it's places like trash middens, hearths, and privies. So there's also this kind of bias toward what types of things are you finding? And that often reflects daily practices, foodways, um, fuel wood, et cetera. So my, my time in the archives was really meant to get at some of the other plants that people are using that we don't find. Um, and so these are some of the materials that I looked at. Um, I went through account books, correspondence, letters, land deeds, diaries, receipts, and, and cookbooks, commonplace books, um, which often included newspaper clippings and advertisements. Um, and I eventually made my way to school books and the few landscape architecture plans that the collections had that were, were relevant. Um, it, it's, it's also worth me kind of explaining that as I applied for this fellowship, I was finishing up my master's thesis, which was on um, human plant relationships between American Indians in the North Carolina Piedmont um, just before and right after Europeans arrived. Um, and that my dissertation is now looking at human plant relationships in the colonial Chesapeake. So there, there's a little bit of shifting, but um, North Carolina, because of the Department of Anthropology and the Research Labs of Archaeology, has a very strong record on what plant use looks like before Europeans were in North Carolina. And that doesn't exist for all states. Um, and so I wanted to create a model for what indigenous plant use looked like in North Carolina. Um, and what colonial plant used to look like in North Carolina, but that kind of shifted over time with COVID and as my dissertation took shape. Um, but I did find some, some relevant things. Um, and I also started working on a digital exhibit that investigated um, ethnomedicinal practices by African-Americans um, at this, um, during that kind of gap due to COVID. Um, and so account books, correspondence and land deeds were things I had originally thought were gonna give me some good data. And I pretty quickly realized I wasn't getting the details that I wanted. Um, and that things like receipts, cookbooks, commonplace books actually had more um, and unique details for the, the types of relationships I was looking for. Um, the same thing with school books and newspaper clippings. It was just things that I, I didn't originally think to include, but turned out to be uh, really insightful. And so I'll go through some of the, the main findings I'm gonna connect to my dissertation and, and um, explain those. So one of the most important materials I looked at was this herbal from the Preston Davies collection. It dates to the 18th century, though it's unclear exactly when it was written. It seems that it may have been um, two books that were kind of mashed together. And it looks like it was authored by someone who was working as a physician who had strong ties to England. Probably they immigrated and started practicing as a physician in South Carolina. Um, but there's some indigenous influences that can be found in the listed remedies, like this clipping I have about peach tree um, and peach tree leaves. That was a, a common kind of uh, remedy that Southeastern American Indians would use to treat um, worms and parasites. And so it's interesting to find this physician had um, something that was quite similar. He also references John Gerard's herbal, which is really famous and has multiple editions. Um, and references it with direct page numbers. So it'd be interesting to go back through this herbal to try to date it better, looking at all of Gerard's different editions and, and seeing which match up the best. I think that could give a better date. But this herbal was, was great. It had all sorts of things. And, and one of the things that I really enjoyed from it was that the author would go back and add notes to the different remedies. And so like this one where he's talking about using figs to treat uh, the distempers of the liver. At one point he goes back and crosses out writing, not good. So you see a little bit of the trial and error. Another thing that I, that I just found everywhere was receipts um, for all sorts of things. I'm gonna talk mainly about kind of the medicinal ones in, in this talk, but you know, there was receipts for making different dyes, for getting rid of bed bugs, all sorts of things. Um, and, and often they, they kind of um, made me realize yet again that medicine before the 20th century was really uh, more of an art than a science. Um, and there's a lot of kind of medieval holdovers that are they're still um, living on in people's minds. Um, and so like this one we see right here, it mentioned using dried toad and keeping it in a silk pouch um, to help with your ailments. 
Um, there's other ones where they talk about, you know, how to treat things like your hair falling out or removing freckles um, and then more serious things like spitting up blood. Um, so it was a little bit of, of everything was kind of found in these receipts. Another interesting thing with the receipts is that they were often attributed to certain individuals. Um, this was more common with cookbooks um, and it especially in, emphasized the connections between um, North Carolina's elite throughout the 20th and 19th and 18th century and how these people were sharing recipes um, and also appropriating uh, recipes from their neighbors or um, you know, the enslaved populations. There was also evidence that people were adopting unfamiliar foods and they were connecting that to the identity of the person that they had um, learned about the recipe from. Uh, this recipe from 1804 um, is connected, it's about boiling rice. It's, it's connected to a person from uh, the West Indies and they, you know, they specify that it's a black individual who had given this recipe. And you know, they were a little skeptical at first, but they enjoyed it. Um, I also found there was references where there were, were instances of people being reticent to share knowledge. Um, this account comes from a commonplace book from the early 1800s, and it's detailing the story of um, a cure for cancer. And um, they wanted to use narrow leaf doc because a, an American Indian woman had, had shown up at the right place to, to help this uh, white woman. And she had hid what she was trading her with. She um, had, had the woman who was ill with cancer agreed to, to let her treat her, um, but she wasn't gonna devolve the secrets of, of what she was using. Um, but at some point, you know, the woman, she snatches a little bit of the roots away and plants them um, and finds that it's a narrow leaf dock, which grows. And then the story continues that the woman who was then cured of cancer then treats her friends and the, the, you know, the remedy spreads. Um, I'm not entirely sure how, how factual this is. There's rare, it's pretty rare to find a recipe that only has one ingredient um, and one that was so effectual. The other thing is that narrow leaf dock is not native to North America. Um, there are instances of American Indians using it, but it, it's later and it's not in really the Eastern woodlands. Um, so that's kind of an interesting detail there. Another thing that my research influenced was the importance of orchards um, and subsequently alcohol. Uh, I found some really great landscape architecture plans uh, connected to the Cameron family where they, they detail all of the different types of trees they had growing in their orchards. Um, just oodles and oodles of pear trees and varieties I'd never heard of, but they were you know, very specific about what they had. Um, and really just a wide range of fruit was grown with the idea of turning it into alcohol and, and preserving it. Um, there was also instructions for how to grow these trees and, and details about who to contact to order them. Um, and then there was also a, a colonial letter I found, and that's up in this corner. And it, it details a story of a man from 1870 living in Hillsboro. Uh, there's a land dispute where, where a neighbor is trying to claim his land. Um, and it's at the same time that the peaches are, are starting to ripen. And the man gives this really you know, harrowing account of a mob coming and, and threatening to take his peaches. And he's writing his lawyer very upset saying, you know, I, I can't leave my house. I'm really worried about losing my, my peaches and my home. Please do something ASAP. Um, not quite sure how that ended up turning out, but it was, it was interesting that he was you know, very adamant about not only losing his home, but his crop of peaches. And so I also found information about how people were acquiring plants. Um, so there was, you know, lists of things that people wanted to order and who they wanted to order them from. Um, I also found um, a little bit later in, in the 19th century, but um, lists of, of different plants that, you know, the, the Confederates were, were requesting. Um, it has a little bit of everything. And so uh, there's some literature out there that talks about how um, African American women were actually uh, played a, a large role in, in the Confederates, um, you know, limited success and, and how they were able to um, deal with medical shortages and, and a shortage of supplies through sharing that knowledge, um, not always willingly, but there was different um, kind of things at stake and, and different benefits for people to, to share that knowledge and to collect these herbs and um, to do what they could to improve their own well-being. 
Okay, so I, oh, and then here um, is the educational materials. Uh, this was another kind of element that I, I was surprised to find was actually um, relevant for, uh, for understanding how plant use happened in the past and how plants were such a large part of everyday life. Um, so, you know, school children, they're learning really practical knowledge about yields and, and how much to sell things for. Um, and then this, this image that popped up here um, was from a, a, a school book that dated um, to about the middle 19th century, but it, it's talking about the different regions of the US in terms of what they're exporting. Um, and so it's clear that this is quite important for how people see their own region and how they see other Americans. Um, and they de devoted quite a, a large amount of time to discussing that. Um, and it's also really interesting what people are, are learning in school and how that type of information is being indoctrinated and um, what's important. Okay, so that, that's the end of my slideshow. I know that was a little quick, but happy to take some questions now, or we could talk more. If anybody has an immediate question, if not, we can go on to Gina's and we can circle back as we think about what you found. Oh, it looks like Maria has a question. I think she's clapping. Oh. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you were raising your hand. Um, well, let's go on to Gina and um, then we'll circle back, Sierra. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sierra. It's really fascinating to hear about your work. Um, I, I do want to say, even though I'm not in Chapel Hill, it's always a good day to be in North Carolina. Uh, I was a born and raised in Mebane and my family, a lot of my family's from uh, down east. So, uh, and I, my first book, which was came out of my dissertation was really supported by uh, my work at the Southern Historical Collection. So it's good to be um, back with another uh, project that the collections really support. And um, I, I just always feel a real research home there and I really appreciate the chance uh, to speak today. And there's such a nice convergence because this uh, new project I'm working on, although I guess it's not new anymore, I'm finishing the manuscript uh, right now to get it off to the press, but is about erosion and soil science. Um, and so that has, I think, a lot of uh, convergence with Sierra's work in plants. So I will uh, share my screen and do the the ritual of can you see this um and you can see this and then i had one slide that was being a bit problematic but i think i fixed it uh in the interim so um you can still see this yes and does it move when i do that or no it's still the title screen okay all right i did not fix it as i was not as clever but you see the title screen here yes okay um, so my new book is uh, Erosion, American Literature and Anxiety of Disappearance. Uh, this first uh, photo is actually a photo I took of Providence Canyon, Georgia, which I was interested in before I really thought about this project, but we'll come back to Providence Canyon and the collections. Um, the project I thought started when I saw this map um, in a book, I was doing some research for a class I was teaching about literature of Georgia. Um, and I was looking at something about Southwestern Georgia. And I came across this map that originates with one of the collections I ended up spending a lot of time in, which was the Hugh Hammond Bennett collection. But it's the National Resources Board Land Use um, General Distribution of Erosion in 1934. Um, obviously the dust bowl is on everyone's mind. And when I saw this map, um, having worked in indigenous studies in the Southeast for a long time, I was really struck because the places marked as severe erosion, all were places that had had sites either of heavy indigenous um, occupation, land use um, conflict, or were sites around series sites of removal. So those are in pink. You see the Appalachians in the Southeast. Then you see what um, became Oklahoma, but in the 19th century was known as Indian Territory. And then you also see some space out West that is 
a, a big issue in Nez Perce um, land use wars. So there's erosion there. And then the area is marked as erosion unimportant, which becomes ironic later, um, which are most of Eastern North Carolina, Southern Louisiana, which there was a time we thought erosion was unimportant there. Um, Southern Florida, we know Miami is going to be in the water. Um, issues up by the Great Lakes and Northern California. What a lot of these spaces have in common is these are places where indigenous people actually avoided removal um, and did um, remain in place. And so that that this land is labeled in 34 as, even though we know it geologically, it was already feeling the effects of erosion and is even more so today, um, that these were places kind of just, this issue was deemed unimportant. And when I saw this map, I thought, oh my God, something is going on here. And that's what generated my um, kind of thinking for this book. So to move sort of um, quickly, just some of the motivating questions of the project overall, because I'm a literary studies scholar who's worked a lot in regionalism, I'm interested in how literary regionalism shapes popular discourses about geological phenomena of the earth on that local scale, how we tell stories, and then how narrative construction um, affects our understanding of planetary crisis, including issues such as erosion, obviously today, climate change, which it's they're related issues, but they're not the same. And then how much contemporary humanities-based Anthropocene discourse is born of settler colonial anxieties about the physical disappearance of stolen land. Of course, it's if you go to a lot of trouble to steal something and then it disappears, that I think that causes a lot of anxiety, ironically, for people. And then um, to what extent does the material disappearance of land following the removal of its indigenous peoples force a recognition of indigenous knowledges that have long asserted a physical connection between the presence of the people and the presence of the earth? So when indigenous people are removed, if you time and again start to see land use practices that come in with settlers and then the physical earth is gone. And this is important in the case of something like Southeastern Louisiana, and we have these contemporary movements of land back, but what does land back look like if colonialism has, the land is gone? What gets given back in that case? And what does restitution look like? Um, so immediately I knew this project could not be written without focusing on Hugh Hammond Bennett, whose papers are in the collections. Even in the 30s, Bennett is very clear. Um, we see several quotes here from his Great Plains Drought Area Committee report, really condemning settler colonialism. Um, and in this last one, the settlers lacked both the knowledge and incentive necessary to avoid these mistakes. They were misled by those who should have been their natural guides. And Bennett is all over the place and his as a graduate student, I worked with Paul Green, as you all know, as a voluminous collection. And as luck would have it, I picked another kind of voluminous collection that is at the center of the second project. But it's, a, it's been a real pleasure to get to work in his papers. And I'll spend the majority of the time talking about um, how they inform multiple chapters. There just is no discussion of soil erosion in this country without paying attention to the massive amount of work that Bennett did. Um, and also Bennett's recognition, while he's worried about erosion and his crisis, he also as a soil scientist is very much so aware that some places have to erode for other places to have land. So Southeastern Louisiana, the problem with erosion is because of the way the Mississippi has been constricted and then that land deposit doesn't like nourish and renourish uh, the Delta. Um, so I'm gonna go through the chapters of the book and then kind of talk about how my work in the collection informed each one. Um, my chapters are organized, one to complicate a typical US colonial theolo theology um, that moves from East to West uh, as North Carolinians, we are often uh, 
blessed with getting to come first whenever we pick up any history of the U.S. We think, oh yeah, it all begins here. Like uh, we start with the lost colony. We've all spent time on Roanoke Island in one way or another, imaginatively. But that is just that renders U.S. literary history as a process of colonialism, not recognizing it as a place, and that. Uh, History and land is largely uh, the same age everywhere. Um, when we think about something like literary stories, not necessarily to a geologist. Um, so I do start on the West Coast. And then I try to zoom in and out on assumptions of locality to really trouble exceptionalism, Southern exceptionalism, California exceptionalism. All regions have um, these pervasive narratives of why they are exceptional. Um, they are not, they're just, every place is just different. And so that's how these chapters work. Two chapters that don't really, um, I didn't work in the collection. There are other collections and archives that inform more heavily is the first one on California. These are the texts I largely look at for the California chapter. And then the um, chapter on Louisiana, um, there are some, collections that are more robust for what I'm looking at there, but these are the anchor text for that chapter. So where I really start with the Southern Historical Collection and the materials at the Wilson are with chapter two that focuses on um, Oklahoma and the Dust Bowl. The three sort of sites in this are obviously, you can't get around John Steinbeck and the Grapes of Wrath, Dorothea Lang's photography with Migrant Mother. Um, this is actually um, Florence Thompson, who was a Cherokee woman. Um, she's later identified, and that's a real center of this chapter. And then Lynn Riggs, uh, the Cherokee playwright, who um, spends a lot of time thinking about the territory in his work and these questions of land use. This chapter, Bennett's papers and materials are central to this. The Dust Bowl is what catapults Hugh Hammond Bennett to fame. And within the collections at the SHC, his scrapbooks, his letters, his photos, his manuscripts. I mean, it. I love someone who saves everything like Paul Green that has ever happened to them. Um, Bennett is definitely one of those figures. Um, there are several Lynn Riggs manuscripts and correspondence interspersed um, in the Paul Green collection, as well as the miscellaneous scripts collection. And then just the period, the general dust ball information that emerges out of these papers. Um, and one text that I knew the collection had from my previous work is Lynn Riggs uh, work on his theory of the theater, The Vine, where um, that is a the vine is a serious 1930s, 40s metaphor of controlling erosion with the importation of kudzu um, and other vine-based, uh, put this in quote, solutions to erosion problems. Um, so this, uh, this chapter, Bennett is kind of in the background, but of course his scrapbooks of everything and his reports that he's working on with the Soil Conservation Service is the historical kind of a underside framework to my literary readings and kind of cultural readings of Lang's work, Steinbeck and Riggs together. Similarly, then the fourth chapter um, is takes us back to Providence Canyon, Georgia. Um, if the Oklahoma statehood crisis for indigenous peoples in Oklahoma um, centers chapter two, and then there's the Louisiana chapter. Chapter four is really this, what happens after removal in the Southeast. Um, I focus on Providence Canyon. I argue that Gone with the Wind is actually a novel about the Dust Bowl um, and soil anxiety. I will point out that the title itself is an erosion metaphor. Um, wind erosion is the 
is on the paper every single day while Mitchell is writing this. And when you really go in and start to pay attention to the soil science and the appearances of soil concerns, gullying, overcropping, crop rotation, um, the book is just covered in it. I'm quite excited to make this argument because it's uh, when you have something new to say about Gone with the Wind, uh, never, but I feel like I do. Um, and then this uh, kind of updated art installation for that Elizabeth Webb has done about Providence Canyon um, ends the chapter. Now, Bennett is also all over this because of his scrapbooks. We think of Bennett most closely associated with the Dust Bowl because that's where his fame comes from. But one of the things I really found in the collection I was hoping to find and I did find is and I had seen hints of this in other books where Bennett makes appearances, is that he really thought the gullying as the um, holdover from plantation agriculture and then sharecropping in the Southeast was a greater erosion concern than the wind erosion um, that's happening in Western Oklahoma. And in fact, gullying is the erosion issue in Eastern Oklahoma that he thinks is more insidious in many ways than where, where the popular framework from the time was, which was that Western wind sheet erosion of the Dust Bowl proper. Um, so here we have one um, news clipping of Bennett's. Uh, he's in the paper all the time explaining these issues. Uh, worst erosion losses in the country are found in the Chattahoochee River Valley. You can see that period that um, part in black is Providence Canyon. And then also uh, the kind of folklore aspects around why the canyon started. Because um, the canyon didn't exist until uh, Muscogee Creek removal. And then it appears very quickly on the landscape in almost 40 years. And one of the folk um, explanations was that a woman had just dumped her dishwater in the same place. I, I would like to just... Providence Canyon, this did not happen because someone dropped, like poured out their dishwater in the same place every night for 15 years. Um, but Bennett was clearly interested in the public narrative of this. And there's another one I didn't have time to show. My quality of this is not very good, but there's a cartoon that says, erosion is gone with the wind the southern farmer erosion and it says not gone with the wind gone with the water which is one of those finds when you're trying to I'm kind of a muralist in my work when you're trying to put it all together you think aha like there it is I did not come up with this by myself um and uh there's also I don't know if you can see me in my screen at the same time but Bennett's textbook on soil conservation, which I actually found a copy I could afford and order while I was in the reading room, all the things we do in the reading room, uh, aside from just look at the things in front of us, the frontispiece image of this um, is Providence Canyon. So the very, well, I can't find it right now. You'll have to believe me. Um, this was the space for Bennett, even though he's so closely associated with the Dust Bowl. Uh, this is where I really found the most that like kind of anchors what Bennett saw being from the Piedmont of North Carolina, being familiar with the agricultural plans of the Southeast, he saw as a serious crisis. And interestingly, um, I'm gonna wrap up with Bennett here before I talk about this last piece of the book, Bennett tried his hand at fiction. Uh, and there are a few manuscripts where he tries to tell the story of like farmer John who doesn't, who needs to understand about how to control erosion on his farm. There's a reason why Bennett was a famous soil scientist and we don't know him as a famous uh, fiction writer. But it confirms for me a little bit of the impetus of the project that, um, telling each other stories about how these things happen and how crises happen are a backbone of how we understand geological phenomena 
climate change phenomena, the, the stories we tell really do matter in addition to the science. And Bennett is such an interesting figure because it's clear in his archive, he also believes that. Um, and he is frequently looking to indigenous people's knowledges across the world for how other people controlled erosion. Um, so it makes him really interesting kind of uh, figure for my book, even though he's not a creative writer, so much of his work is just proven instructive and helpful to get the general sensibility about how people thought about this issue across, across the 20th century. Now, the last chapter brings me home, figuratively and literally. Um, I'm looking at a debate that's probably familiar to many of us. I'm looking at the Eastern Seaboard and the two kind of events that I look at narratives about are the debate over Shell Island Resort um, at the northern end of Wrightsville Beach. Shell Island, as you may know, used to be a separate island before they um, filled in the inlet where the, if you're familiar with Wrightsville Beach, where the Holiday Inn is now. And then also I look at Tangier Island in the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. Um, Shell Island is near and dear and um, Mason Inlet is near and dear to me because I was a summer ventures <laughs> a participant and student and I worked on taking core samples on Mason Inlet and tracked the rate of erosion as a high school student, which then I kind of had a moment in the collection where I thought, oh, this project didn't begin when I saw this map from the Soil Conservation Board. This project started when I was 16 years old and I learned about the erosion debate at Shell Island. Um, Ellen Bash's manuscript on Shell Island is a key creative story um, for this piece. And I look at Tangier Island, I don't pay as much attention to in the Southern Historical Collection. So I really wanna talk about Shell Island. And the, Interestingly about the debate, something I did not know about Shell Island um, is that it up until uh, in the 1920s, they tried to make it um, an exclusively African-American resort um, for leisure. White investors did this. And you'll notice here this one photo is by Hugh McRae Morton, the um, photographer, his photographic collection. But we know that his grandfather, um, was Hugh McRae, who was a central figure in the um, Wilmington, uh, you know, essentially massacre and arson that terrorized Black Wilmington in the late 19th century. Um, McRae gets the initial title for Wrightsville Beach. And at this time, Wrightsville Beach and Shell Island are separate. Something that I didn't know, I didn't know about, you know, that Shell Island had this history as an exclusively Black resort. Um, McRae owns Wrightsville Beach just to the south. There's an inland that separates them. And something I found in the papers um, right before, so Shell Island, the resort burns under what various people describe in different circumstances that have no real uh, consensus. Uh, Shell Island is burned down in the 19, in 1920, the summer of 26. Um, however, or maybe it's the summer of 27, sorry. Um, the dates are important here. When I was looking through McCray's work about the development around Wrightsful Beach, there are these inquiries about him running power and lines, infrastructure lines to the northern end of Wrightsville Beach. Almost at the exact same time, the possible arson happens on Shell Island. Now, I'm not here to draw conspiracy theories, but we know Hugh McRae used arson in the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century in Wilmington. And then I found this letter and I had to read it multiple times. I pulled it several days in a row because something really strange was happening with the um, 
arson at Shell Island and how McRae is already kind of thinking about his development on Wrightsville Beach and some of the people who were involved in the white terror plot in Wilmington are the same people who've invested in Shell Island. Now, I'm a literature scholar. This is far beyond my scope of investigative uh, journalism. But to me, what becomes interesting is all of these sites in the book and uh, this book from UNC Press by um, Andrew Carl has been really helpful to me. Where we're concerned about erosion in narratives in this country, it is almost impossible. This is not land that is already tied up with narratives of who gets to use land, who owns land, what land is valuable. And for me, the debate over saving Shell Island, the replenishment, you know, that has happened at Shell Island, if you go, I mean, it's kind of a marvel, is about who owns the land, who uses the land, and when and how the land is valued. And so um, I'm, this is, I'm still writing and finishing the last chapter now, but this was kind of the biggest thing for me that I kind of found something I didn't expect to find in the collections. And of course, it's just somewhat ironic that Hugh Morton takes pictures of Shell Island and he's the grandson of McRae. Coincidence, you know, makes argument. Um, so the larger takeaways for me, you know, literature and erosion, so what? Uh, I do believe that narrative both limits and enlivens our possibilities for the future and erosion can be solved. And I also point out that US policy can take land claims and indigenous uh, land management into consideration. This has happened in California. And so I know it's a big bulky project. I, I promise if you someday read this book, it will all make sense. I'm pulling this together and the collections have been really helpful for me to start to uh, paint this picture for this project. Uh, and with that, I will uh, leave the rest of our time for questions. Well, thank you. That's, I mean, we love all of our researchers, but I think we love the ones that are sort of um, fit most awkwardly within the collections because you see it in ways that that we don't typically see it. You know, if you're set up for one sort of discipline, you you ignore a lot of things. And that's why this has been such an exciting talk for us. Um, so who would like to begin? Hmm. Well, I could begin because you are so disciplinarily different in many respects from the typical um, researcher that we do have. Were there things that got in your way um, that, we should think about as we, as we go forward to make these more accessible to either anthropologists or to literary scholars. I, I don't think anything got in my way, um, but I, I kind of like losing my way in an archive uh, temporarily for a bit. So for me, you know, the collection is always really exciting because it allows me to sort of be, be a little bit mess, messy for a second. Um, because that's when I sort of find things that I think like, you know, uh, I like a literary studies project that really, you know, non, no pun intended, really like is is grounded in the historical and cultural context of everything that's happening around the book and continues to happen. Um, so I wouldn't say anything um, got, got in my way at all. It's one collection where I often don't feel confined by my exact proposal, you know, get in, get out. Uh, but I don't know, um, maybe that's not the right <laughs> If you want me to think of something, maybe I can. No, no, no. I mean, and, and Hugh Bennett's a good place to wander. Um, I don't know that a lot of literary scholars have wandered as extensively within that collection as you have. Um, that's for sure. Usually it's soil scientists. Um, how about you, Sierra? You, can, you yeah. seem to come with some certain expectations, I think. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me was kind of learning how 
to to piece through the different finding aids um especially because a lot of them were written long ago and they'll, they'll kind of include these really vague mentions of like oh there might be a recipe somewhere within these papers or there might be a letter that talks about you know this type of topic and every once in a while i would get um kind of too caught up in finding those things that were mentioned in in the finding aids and i would end up kind of not wasting time but i felt like i wasn't being as efficient as I could be. Um, I also, you know, had this exploratory fellowship that I, I'm really grateful exists because I, I think so often we get our funding in grad school when we already have a project that's really developed and you don't have that time to kind of go play around in archives. Um, and so, so that was really helpful for me to just kind of get my footing. Um, and I actually have an undergraduate degree in history, but I'd never really done my own independent archival work. I'd always been very directed on, you know, look at this collection or, or look at this document. Um, so to kind of find my footing on my own was really nice. And it's made me more confident to go off to other archives that are going to be more appropriate for my dissertation um, and, and starting that research. Yeah, when um, Maria Estorino came here with the idea of these fellowships and when we were developing it, that is one of the things that I, I think I feel the best about is because how can you know? You, you can you can come up with extraordinary ideas, but then you have to sort of test them against these sorts of sources that have survived. And that's it's pretty wonderful. Oh, um, Maria is asking, she would love to know more about the digital exhibit that you created during the sort of COVID lockdown. Yeah, so I had a fellowship from the UNC's um, public was it? UNC's Humanities for the Public Good Initiative. Um, and so um, part with the Charlotte Brown Hawkins Museum, um, I got to make this digital exhibit that looked at African-American ethnomedicine and I can um, send you the link to that. But I was able to incorporate some of the things that I found into that digital exhibit. Um, um. Don Lucas is asking a question. Um, this is for Sierra. Are there other collections or resources you looked at other than the one, the specific ones that you mentioned in your presentation? Yes. So I looked at a lot of collections. Um, Taylor DeClark was great about pulling just about everything for me. Um, so, I mean, I, I looked at diaries. I got a really insightful um, kind of view into what you know, women's life had looked like in the past um, and how planters talked about their enslaved populations. Um, I didn't include that in today's talk because there, there wasn't a lot that would be um, kind of directly related to human plant relationships, but there were references to things like um, people saving seeds and, you know, preparing for different seasons and, and oh so much talk about the weather. Um, and, and kind of what I got from that was that plants really guided so much more of, of our life ways in the past. Um, they do to a certain extent today, but when there was such a larger percentage of the population who worked as, um, you know, farmers and agriculturalists, it, it really mattered, um, I think, more. And so I, I'm incorporating into my dissertation this kind of holistic approach at looking at plant use and, and recognizing that it's not just food and agriculture, um, but it, you know, it, our plant relationships work our way in in so many different ways that we just overlook. And going back to Gina, I, I guess I'm still a little bit focused on Hugh Bennett in a way. I'm wondering, so you came across him in secondary reading or were you looking for soil scientists that were working, you know, in, in the South that you could look at? I'm just curious how you came to that. Yes, I mean, he um, is everywhere in anything you read about erosion in the 20th century. Um, so, an, uh, even when I was looking at Providence Canyon, I think he's mentioned, you really, you can't read anything about erosion without his name. He is the person who largely, um, brought public consciousness to the issue. And in some respects, like came up with viable solutions. I mean, imagine such a time someone was hired to do policy work and then the public listened to them. Um, and then they all did the thing and it got fixed. Um, so uh, if we could imagine such a time, it was such a remark being there right now is reading his struggles with that were very interesting. Um, so I don't know where I first 
saw his name, but it was clear to me right away that he was going to be at the center of just everything that is kind of said, thought, known about erosion since the 1930s. Um, and so the first thing I typically do when I realize that, you know, someone's name, I always, I look at everyone's bibliography and archival work. And then fortunately I realized that his collections were um, at UNC very quickly. And that's what led me to that. Um, and so from there, when applying for the fellowship, you know, just trying to get as much done in one place as you can, I started piecing together the other chapters and sort of seeing, okay, is there anything else that like fits with this that works with this? But uh, so much of uh, the Bennett is a larger collection than what the finding aid currently represents. Um, I think with, you know, as every um, family member passes and other boxes and, you know, people move things into the collection at different stages of processing. And I kind of enjoy that um, because you can a little bit see, you know, uh, there are two different types of logic of like a processed logic versus a grandchild put things in a box logic that were kind of stacked together. And that, that work doesn't go into the book, but it does help me with the sensibility about how this figure and their family have thought about their work and how it moves over time. It's just two different types of uh, organizing logic that get preserved in different, different ways. Things he probably had the opportunity possibly to organize and things that didn't move into the collection until long after his death. So that's kind of how I approached his materials. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. I think the two of you would have had radically different experiences if I could sort of stereotype. Your your collection was was much more naturalistic. Um, there was less of an archivist hand involved, I think, in the construction of Bennett, given the size and the way that it came in, as opposed to Sierra when she starts working material from the 18th century and earlier. Um, those have been here for a long time, generally, and um, they've been worked over fairly hard. So um, even though I think I, I can imagine the frustration of having the word plant or remedy associated with a body of papers, I must imagine, you know, with the exception of something like um, Preston Davy, which is somewhat larger, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty small pile, <laughs> generally. Oh. Oh, Sierra just shared a link to her digital exhibit, if you all can see that as well. So does anybody else have any other questions? I don't want to ask just librarian type questions. Well, I was, I was interested to see, Gina, at the end that you came back to Andrew Carl, who was actually a, for, a former fellow back in the day, um, who worked here. Have you, have you talked to him? I haven't. Um... I, I, that is on my never ending list of things that I would like, I would like to do. Um, and that it, it's also something I always enjoy, enjoy about being in the collection is looking, you know, you start to realize when you're looking at secondary sources that you are kind of swimming, you know, as, uh, in similar waters as people have been in the collection before, and that some people use this piece of the collection and then this, and you know, when we come in with our kind of our different disciplinary uh, frameworks, it, it's always exciting me to see how we're like building and extending and thinking about each other's work that one person sees this and one person like sees this. So there are so many, um, I think a lot of the bibliography will end up being people who have also worked, you know, in similar or same collections in the SHG, SHC you know, for different ends. Yeah. No, I must confess when I work with researchers and I love Zoom consults now, when we talk about description, the way that we often talk about extending description is to go to something like Google Scholar and put Southern Historical Collection in quotes and then start looking for things like agricultural products or plants or seeds or erosion or some mention. And it's just such a wonderful way of driving at the, um, 
But let's just say the archival glance at a set of boxes is very different than scholarly glance. We all have very different jobs in this regard. Um, Donna Nixon wrote, and she, this, is, this is more of a comment than a question, but I, I agree with her. So much engaging history that I didn't know packed into both of your presentations. Thank you so much. Um, it, it really was very interesting, both to our audience and to me. And I guess if, if there are no more questions, I see applause. Um, I really want to thank you both for coming and sharing with us. And, and please do keep us aware of when your book comes out, Gina, and when your dissertation and publications start to come out, Sierra. We like to highlight those, um, those aspects of our collection. And we also like to use them as bibliographies. So it's sort of <laughs> very helpful. And everybody else is, all, of course, in the comments, which I expect you can see is saying thank you to you as well. Um, well, I guess, oh, I'm sorry. Um, we actually have another forum coming up on May 11th. I always forget this part. When um, Conrad Jacobar is going to be talking about the Southern route to interstate banking, Nations Bank, and the end of New Deal financial order. And Derek White will talk on a million Klansmen on a Negro's Trail, the escape of Matthew Bullock and American lynching on trial. Um, so that should be really interesting. And I think that Conrad, in many ways, is, is, is um, a scholar that's a little bit different, like yourselves. He's chasing um, financial history, which we're seeing increasingly, but hasn't been done as much in the collection as it could be. So that'll be another sort of um, interesting use case for us. Again, thank you both. And um, please keep in contact with us. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.